Each May, in every medical school across the country, the graduating class rises at, as one and swears a solemn, sacred oath that can be traced back 2,500 years to the time of Hippocrates. Primum non nocere. They promise to first do no harm, but harm they will do. Hospital-acquired infections is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. 1.7 million people will become infected after they're admitted to an inpatient institution. And between 100,000 and 200,000 of them will go on to die. Give doctors an exam on hospital-acquired infections, everyone will get an A, every single one of them. They know that the bacterium that causes most people to die from a hospital-acquired infection is Clostridium difficile. As physicians, we call it C. diff. They know that C. diff doesn't go through the air the way the coronavirus does. It's carried on the hands of people. And they're well aware that soap and water or the alcohol-based disinfectants at the entryway to every hospital room is effective at killing this bacterium. And yet, multiple studies across the country in academic facilities and community hospitals have shown that one in every three times when a physician goes from one hospital room to the next, he or she doesn't wash his or her hands. I mean, how is this possible? Doctors are scientists. They follow the most up-to-date literature. They're dedicated to patients. They're committed to saving lives. They've promised to never inflict harm. And yet, one-third of the time, they do actions or fail to take action that would save the lives of patients and by not taking it, inflict harm upon individuals. To understand, come with me back to Vienna, Austria, in the middle of the 19th century. Signaz Semmelweis has just been appointed the head of the maternity service, and he is appalled. The mortality is 18% in his hospital. This is the leading academic facility in all of Europe, but he's embarrassed. The one next door, one run by nurse midwives, mortality is one-third lower. At this time in history, the most common reason women died during childbirth and following childbirth was puerperal fever, an infection that began in the uterus and spread to the body, taking the life of the new mother. And the reason for it, what doctors call the etiology, was said to be miasmas, smelly particles drifting up on air currents from the street below. But Semmelweis asks, why are my patients dying so much more frequently than the ones next door? These laboring mothers are breathing exactly the same air. Now, advances in medicine often happen as a result of serendipity. And so it is in this case. Semmelweis's colleague, while doing an autopsy on a woman who's just died from puerperal fever, nicks his finger. He develops a local infection that spreads through his body with a clinical course that is identical to these women following childbirth. Semmelweis hypothesizes, maybe, maybe there's something these doctors are carrying on their hands, or maybe the leather aprons they wore to protect the well-pressed three-piece suits that's causing this disease. He puts in place a policy. Everyone coming into the delivery area will dip his or her hands in water, chlorinated water. And all physicians will take off those leather aprons and put on a clean one. 
Within a month, mortality drops from 18% to 2%, 90% reduction in the chances of a woman dying. He's thrilled. He writes letters to all the mater doctors overseeing maternity services across Europe. He writes it up in the leading journal. He waits for everyone to all of a sudden adopt his approaches to save the lives of 10,000 women and more every year. And guess what happens? Nothing. He waits and waits and waits. Soon after, he's admitted to a psychiatric facility where he's going to die within a couple of years. You know, if I asked you, why is it so hard in your organizations to make change happen? I'm going to guess you're going to tell me it either costs too much or it takes too much time. Now think about this situation. It doesn't take any time to dip your hands in chlorinated water, one or two seconds. And it costs nothing to put on a clean apron. So why is there so much resistance? Why will it be 50 years before doctors begin to wash their hands? This is the culture of medicine. This is the culture of denial. You see, physicians at the time saw themselves as healers. The idea that they could be responsible for carrying something, because they didn't even yet know what germs were, but something that caused disease, unacceptable. They denied the possibility that it could happen. And those leather aprons, they were symbols of excellence. The more blood, the more pus, the more guts, the more experience you had, the higher your position in the hierarchy of physicians. They would no more give up those dirty aprons than doctors today in university settings would give up their long white coats to put on the short white jackets worn by interns. This is the culture of medicine, and today doctors are still in denial. One third of the time, they fail to wash their hands. And when someone in the hospital gets an infection, they deny that it could be themselves. They assume that it had to be someone else. Culture, particularly the culture of medicine, can't be found in a textbook. You don't hear it in a lecture hall. You learn it by observing the people around you, those who have more status than you do. Doctors early on learn to deny their emotions. They're told that emotions get in the way of objective thinking. They deny that they are tired even at the point of exhaustion that's been shown to have a detrimental impact on patient care. They deny the psychological problems, intrinsic in watching people die, intrinsic in the pain and suffering of human beings, and it leads to a 44% burnout rate amongst physicians and over 400 physician suicides a year, more than one a day in the United States today. You know, I can remember my first day of training. My chief resident said to me, probably sometime this year you're going to wake up feeling sick. You're going to decide that you are too sick to come to work. And if that's the case, I expect to find you in the ICU in a bed when I get there. That is how culture is passed from one generation to the other. But make no mistake, the same culture, the same culture of denial is what makes doctors heroes. It is the best of medicine and not just the worst. Think back to the beginning of 2020. A virus that began in Wuhan, China, travels across the Pacific to the United States. Doctors don't know what it is. They just know that a lot of people are dying more and more every single day from this virus. There's no vaccine to protect them. There are no medications to treat them should they get sick. And they come to work 
12 and 24 hours a day. When there's no protective gear, they don garbage bags in place of gowns, salad lids in place of N95 masks. When patients can't breathe, they take tubes and put them through the mouth into the lung, knowing that every time that tube goes through the vocal cords, the patient's going to cough, spewing virus in their face, and they do it anyway. They're in denial about the consequences of what they do, and it's what allows them to be heroes and save lives. And when two patients can't breathe and there's only one machine, they figure out how to put two people on a single ventilator, and they're in denial. This thing has never been done before, and they do it anyway. It is the best of medicine, and it is the biggest problem of medicine, the culture of medicine and denial. So knowing this, what should you do? What should you do to avail yourselves of the best of that denial that allows the doctor to put your life ahead of theirs? At the same time, how do you protect yourself against the problems that exist? And I'll give you three examples that span the lifespan of your healthcare status. When you're healthy, usually in the early part of your life, or someone you love is healthy, remember, in the culture of medicine, physicians elevate intervention over prevention. So you need to find yourself a really good primary care physician, one who's not in denial about the power that prevention has to avoid disease and to save lives. And then when you have medical problems or loved one have medical problems, remember that in the culture of medicine, physicians elevate procedures over non-invasive treatment. And when a doctor recommends to you that you need to have something done, ask. Is there an alternative? Maybe it's physical therapy, maybe it's nutrition that can improve your health status. Ask the physician, how many times have you done this procedure? And what percent of patients have a complication? And a year later, how many of them have an excellent outcome? If they're honest with you, you may be surprised by the answer. And then finally, towards the end, when you have the types of diseases like metastatic cancer that lead to death with high frequency, and your physicians are recommending multiple procedures and multiple courses of chemotherapy, ask, if I go ahead and do this, and at some point change my mind, decide I can't take any more pain, Will you abide by my preferences? And will you be with me at the end in the most important time period? Or will you desert me in my time of greatest need? The physician culture, the culture of denial, makes doctors heroes, and it makes them create problems. When physicians put your life ahead of theirs, when denial allows them to take risks that aren't rational, please speak up and thank them for their dedication and commitment. But when they use denial in ways that force you into having disease, speak up and ask about prevention. How can I avoid cancer and heart disease? When they tell you about an intervention, speak up and ask them, aren't there some other approaches, more conservative solutions that don't involve the risk of going to the operating room? And at the end of the life, remember that physicians can't see the limitations of medicine. They can't see the inevitability of death and speak up and ask them whether they will, will be with you at the last moment as you confront death, or they desert you before that time. 
And when physicians fail to wash their hands, speak up and make sure they do so. Thank you.